friends, the title of this talk is God's Not Dead. There was a popular hymn sung many years ago at charismatic prayer meetings, especially in Bombay, which is where I am. Is God dead? Is God dead? No, 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 God's not dead. He is alive. That's the way the song went. Now I'm asking the question, okay, God's not dead, but was God dead? Was God dead before he woke up, so to speak, and did all the mighty acts of salvation that the Bible tells us about? Obviously, the answer is no, 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 God was not dead. Though the Bible cannot tell us about what God was doing outside the biblical area, God was not dead. He was alive and active even before the events recorded in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament, chapters 1 to 11, talks about prehistory. And then from chapter 12 onwards, Abraham, etc., about the Jews. Only about what God was doing with the Jews. And then, of course, 2,000 years later, Abraham was about 2,000 before Christ. So, 2,000 years later, God sent Jesus Christ to dwell amongst us and start a new religion called Christianity. Chart of biblical timelines will show us that 4,000 years of history is covered in the Old and New Testament of the Bible. But God was not dead before those 4,000 years or outside the Bible areas. So we have to find out what was God doing elsewhere. And this comes from the developing teaching of the Catholic Church. So the Church teaches us that according to Jesus, the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. John 14, 26. So there is a development of doctrine in the Church. It is not new doctrine, but a reinterpretation of what was already there. It is the signs of the times. And this came about in a brilliant way from the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council helped us Catholics to widen, to broaden the horizons of our minds. I have some of this in my other book, which is Contemplating God's Word. Reflections on 30 most important New Testament texts. So Pope Paul VI, after the Vatican Council, Pope St. John Paul II, then Pope Benedict XVI, and now our own Pope Francis is helping us to authentically broaden the horizons of our minds. First, I am as, a, as a Jesuit, I would like to point out that St. Ignatius of Loyola had already captured the spirit that God is not dead. God is not dead in our time. God was not dead before our time. God is not dead outside our circle. And he summarized it all by the well-known phrase, finding God in all things, even in creation even in the trees and inanimate uh, creatures. In his famous book, The Spiritual Exercises, he says, we must consider how God works and labors for me in all created things on the face of the earth, in the heavens, in the plants, the fruits, the cattle, giving them life, preserving them, giving them vegetation and sensation, and so on. 
And so St. Ignatius tells us, man and woman are created to praise, reverence, and serve God, and by this means to be fulfilled, to save our souls. And all the other things on the face of the earth are created for us, that they may help us in prosecuting the end for which we are created. Now obviously these words don't apply only to Christians, but to all human beings of whatever race or religion who in fact have been all created in God's image. The Second Vatican Council tells us about God's work in other peoples, other religions, nor is God far distant from those who in shadows and images seek the unknown God, for it is He who gives to all people life and breath and all things, and, notice this, as Saviour wills that all people be saved. This is from the famous document on the church, Lumen Gentium, number 16. Actually, not only St. Ignatius and the Vatican Council, but already St. Paul had acknowledged in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, that God was at work in every human family. So these are the words of Ephesians. This then is what I pray, kneeling before the Father from whom every family, whether spiritual or natural, takes its name. And later, when he went to Athens, he found an altar there the, to the unknown God. He told them, I've come to preach to you about this unknown God you were worshipping without a name. Now I give you the name, his Jesus Christ. But, you know, St. Paul had the broadening of his minds wonderfully achieved when he met Jesus. So though the other Jews and he himself before that would say that there's no salvation outside the Jews, only the Jews are saved. Now he writes in Romans, I read, for God shows no partiality, for it is not the hearers of the law, that is the law of Moses, who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. When Gentiles, that means non-Jews, all the other peoples in the world, who have not the law of Moses, do by nature what the law requires, by nature, that means by their conscience, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have that law of Moses. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, not on stones, on tablets of stone like the Ten Commandments, but the law is written on every person's heart. For, now see these strong words, for he is not a real Jew who is one outwardly, just keeping some rules and rituals, nor is true circumcision something external and physical, he is a Jew, that means one saved, who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart, spiritual and not literal. His praise is not from men, but from God. So this universal scope of God's work in the church, outside the church, is what St. John Paul II guided by the Holy Spirit, stated in an encyclical, the encyclical on the Holy Spirit. This is what he says, the Spirit's presence and activity affect not only individuals, but also society and history, peoples, cultures and religions. Indeed, the Holy Spirit is at the origin of the noble ideals and undertakings which benefit humanity on its journey through history. So in that encyclical on the Holy Spirit, he says, the breath of the divine life, 
which is the Holy Spirit, in its most common manner, simplest and most common manner, expresses itself and makes itself felt in prayer. So the work of the Holy Spirit in all human beings is prayer. It is a beautiful and salutary thought that wherever people are praying in the world, there the Holy Spirit is the living breath of prayer. It is a beautiful and salutary thought for all Christians, mind you, whether charismatic or any other movement or no movement. It is a beautiful and salutary thought for all people to recognize that if prayer is offered throughout the world, in the past, in the past, in the present and in the future, equally widespread is the presence and action of the Holy Spirit who breeds prayer in the heart of human beings in all the endless range of the most varied situations and conditions. Some conditions are favorable, sometimes they are unfavorable to the spiritual and religious life. So see, for the broadening of the horizons of our minds, we have to acknowledge God is at work, not just inside the church, in all human hearts. Several reliable fathers of the church already, so before St. Ignatius and the Vatican Council, after St. Paul, of course. For example, St. Augustine taught, when we say that Christ is the Word of God, capital W, through whom all things were made, we say also that he is the Son of God, co-eternal with the Father, the unchangeable wisdom by whom the whole universe was created and who becomes that happiness of every rational soul. Now listen to these words. Therefore, from the beginning of the human race, that means just billions of years before that we were talking about, about 200,000 years since the beginning of human beings. From the beginning of the human race, all those who believed in God, not obviously the God of the Old Testament or the God of Jesus Christ, but God, a, a, a higher being, all those who believed in God and lived a good and devout life according to his commands, that means according to their conscience, whenever and wherever they lived, they were undoubtedly saved by this Son of God, Jesus Christ. So even before Jesus was born, he was saving people because he was the eternal word. Today's Pope Francis, completely true to Catholic tradition and to his special Jesuit inheritance, is also clearly and strikingly helping the church and the world to broaden the horizons of their minds by reaching out to and showing practical concern for all God's creation, the poor, the marginalized, our polluted cosmos being destroyed even more every day by big business corporations. Pope Francis is stressing the need for fraternity among members of all religions and so on. Of course, he's being attacked. Jesus himself taught and experienced that no man is a prophet to his own people. So Pope Francis is being attacked and labeled as a bad leader by Catholics, rich Catholics, by those whose minds are not widened by the Spirit, by those who have vested interests in perpetuating the status quo, the big gap between the rich and the poor. However, Francis is a spirit-filled and humble and holy man. He will continue to speak and do what God has called him to do. He will not be frightened of criticism. His model is Jesus Christ and St. Ignatius of Loyola and St. Francis of Assisi. So let us now try to broaden the horizons of our minds, not stay petty-minded, 
with fixed and often incorrect views that keep us locked up in our often pious and fundamentalist ghettos. But as the prayer for Pentecost Sunday puts it, and I explained this in my first talk, Father Almighty, send your spirit with the force of a mighty wind to broaden the horizons of our minds. That is the main work which the Spirit wants today in all of us. So we get this broadening of our minds from science, from history, from culture, and we can really appreciate how great is our God. He was never dead. He was and is and always will be alive and active. So let us look at this from the point of view of Jesus saying, Go out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. Ask yourself, when Jesus gave this command to his apostles 2,000 years ago, the biblical knowledge of the whole world, go to the whole world, what did that mean? That whole world for them was very small. The sacred authors knew little or nothing about other peoples and civilizations flourishing beyond the lands of Abraham, Palestine, Egypt, Syria, and a few parts of the Roman Empire and Asia Minor. Even India was unknown to the apostles at that time, till Thomas came. India in the Bible is mentioned only once, twice, in the book of Esther. And how is it mentioned? As being the eastern limit of the empire of Ahasuerus. But in fact, God's Spirit was inspiring the rise of great civilizations and great religions and religious leaders in India, China, Japan, the Americas, North and South, etc. So go out to the whole world does not mean go out only to the Jewish and early Christian areas. God was at work elsewhere, not limited to Christianity, let us say. So what was God doing in extra biblical places, when at the same time he was doing great things in biblical geographical areas? First, between 2000 and 1000 BC, before Christ. That is the time of Moses and David. Now in that same time frame, they lived and died in Persia, which is modern Iran, the prophet Zoroaster. And what was he teaching? That there is one universal, all good and uncreated supreme creator God called Ahura Mazda, or the wise Lord. You see, that we are one God only. In fact, now we as Christians know that this one God is of three persons. But already before Christianity, before, uh, even before most of the prophets of the Old Testament, Zoroaster, is teaching about one supreme God. And so Zoroastrianism is one of the world's oldest serving, surviving religions. Their teachings are older than Judaism, older than Buddhism, older than Christianity, older than Islam. Second, about the time when God called Moses to lead the Jews out of Egypt, which is the Exodus, about 1500 BC, they began close to our country, India, the late Harappan phase of the Indus Valley civilization between 1700 and 1300 BC. So God's Spirit was at work there, helping humanity build something new for those people who were not biblical peoples. So here I would like to read from the Second Vatican Council. Individual and collective activity 
that monumental effort of man through the centuries to improve the circumstances of the world presents no problem to believers. So we need not worry about, but all that happened outside the Bible. Of course, it happened wherever human beings are alive. Considered in itself, the Vatican Council says, all that corresponds to the plan of God. When men and women provide for themselves and their families in such a way as to be of service to the community, they can rightly look upon their work as a prolongation of the work of the Creator, a service of their fellow men and women, and their personal contribution to the fulfillment in history of God's divine plan. See, the Council tells us, far from considering the conquests of man's genius and courage as opposed to God's power, as if he set himself up as a rival to the Creator, the Christian ought to be convinced that the achievements of the human race, listen to this, the Christian ought to be convinced that the achievements of the human race are a sign of God's greatness and the fulfillment of his ineffable design. That is from the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes, number 33 and 34. The third date that we look at is 1000 BC. This is about the time when David was king in the Old Testament and when 100 years later in 900 BC, the first edition of the Bible, the Pentateuch, got written down. So in this time, what was happening in India? In India, the Vedic age, 1700 BC to 500 BC, saw the compilation of the Vedic Sanskrit texts, the Vedas. Situated on the Indo-Gangetic plain, the Vedic Hindu his civilization formed the basis of what is called today Hinduism and Indian culture. In the early Vedic period, 1700 to 1000 BC, the Rig Veda was compiled. And during this time, the king was believed to be the protector of the people who took an active part in the government. In the Old Testament, 500 BC is roughly the time of the exile of the Jews to Babylon and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And a few years later, the completion of the priestly version of the Hebrew Bible. So the Hebrew Bible was put together about this time, Old Testament Bible minus the seven books which came later, after 500 BC. But 39 books were there already in 500 BC. But what about in India? In 599 BC in India, Mahavir was born, founder of Jainism. And in 563 BC, few years later, Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism. In 538 BC, Cyrus the Great conquered parts of today's Pakistan. And in 500 BC, we have the earliest written records in Brahmi. So with this, the Vedic civilization came to an end. And therefore, Jainism and Buddhism began to spread. The teachings of the Buddha were later propagated throughout the world by Emperor Ashoka. All this is about the same time as the exile of the Jews, 500 BC. And what about China? At the same time, 500 BC, in China was born Confucius and his philosophy, Confucianism, emphasized personal and governmental morality correctness of social relationships, justice, kindness, sincerity. All this formed their conscience and they lived good lives according to the grace they received from God.
Then much later, in 399, a Chinese scholar, Fahian, traveled to India. I'm just trying to put it us in perspective to see what was happening in the Old Testament, what was happening elsewhere in the world. So in these later centuries before Christ in the Old Testament, the Maccabees, so after 500, the Maccabees rose up and overthrew the Seleucid Empire and started what is called the Hasmonean dynasty, which ruled till a few years before the birth of Christ. For instance, Herod. Now, again, before the coming of Christ, in 333 BC, Darius III was defeated by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great reached almost to the Punjab. And then, of course, came the reign of Ashoka and the Maurya Empire and so on and so on. And this is the time when the Emperor Ashoka became a Buddhist and Buddhism began to spread. Okay, now we come to Christianity. 33 AD, because Christ died in that year, presumably, and Pentecost Sunday took place then. So Christianity begins in about 33 AD, means Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. So Christianity now begins to spread to the whole world, Jesus telling them, go to the whole world, including which visits now by the apostles Thomas and Bartholomew to India. Then came Marco Polo in the 13th century. And in the 15th century, Vasco da Gama came here to Goa. And Francis Xavier came in 1542. But then, 600 years after Christianity began, a new religion arose called Islam, about 600 AD. It is also a monotheistic Abrahamic religion, teaching that there is only one God, and that Muhammad is the ultimate messenger of God. And these, this Islam came to India with the first Muslim invasion in 761 AD. But not only India, we are looking at extra-biblical places. Great civilizations also grew in China, in Japan, in North America among so-called Red Indians or the indigenous tribes, and in South America among the Aztecs, the Incas, etc., etc. So with all this, we can again ask, was God dead? Did he wake up only for Abraham? <coughs> no. Over the centuries, while our great God was at work in biblical areas among Jews and then as Christians, he was also at work in different ways among all of humanity. Now what is going to be the climax? St. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, the climax of all this activity of God throughout the centuries, everywhere among all nations, the climax is going to be that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, St. Paul says there are varieties of working, but it is the same God who inspires them all in everyone. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6. So, from the above, we conclude that God was not dead before the Old Testament started or after the New Testament began. Let us repeat again what John Paul II said. The Spirit's presence and activity affect not only individuals, but also society and history, peoples, cultures, and religions. Indeed, the Spirit is at the origin of the noble ideals and undertakings which benefit humanity on its journey through history. That is from his encyclical 
on the Lord of missions, Redeemer of the, missial, of the missions. So, reading all the signs of the times, today's Catholic Church has embarked on what is called the new evangelization, which includes a new opening and a new understanding of other religions, so that collaboration and building bridges with people of other faiths becomes a priority for us. Because, as again St. John Paul said, it is the Holy Spirit who is at the origin of the noble ideals and undertakings which benefit humanity on its journey through history. Now to show about God's work, not only, you might say, salvation history, which includes the salvation God was working among all human beings, we can look also at what science tells us about God's work. But we have already done this in a previous talk, so I'll just summarize it. Psalm 19 verse 1 tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. So God speaks to us through two books, the books of Scripture, the Bible, and the book of nature. One refers to religion and theology. The book of nature refers to science and verifiable evidence. Unfortunately, as I said already, till recently, often science and religion were seen as opposed to each other. But the happy surprise is that now, in this third millennium, more and more scientists as well as theologians and Popes John Paul II, Benedict XVI and Francis are talking about the complementarity, complementary role of the two books, the book of scripture and the book of nature. In fact, so many very recent findings in astronomy and cosmology, for example, gravitational waves, a hundred million black holes in our Milky Way itself, etc. All these are verifying and extending our knowledge of the Creator's almighty power as well as of God's immense wisdom. So let us, every time we think of what God is doing, God is not dead. He's alive, he's at work. Science tells us that today that there is enormous energy emanating from colliding black holes. This is more than a thousand times, a thousand suns, a mind-boggling figure. And so creation and God at work in creation must make us praise God must make us say, O oh God, you are great. You are a wonderful God. Dis despite the incredible number of moving and interacting celestial beings, normal life proceeds smoothly. And with all the micro-surgery, medical and other new findings of DNA and all, it just can give us new meaning and depth to our spirituality. So whenever we say glory be to the Father, to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, let us do it by broadening the horizons of our minds and using the contemporary findings of science and of faith to strengthen our belief and our faith. Let not our old formula prayers be just recited mechanically, but be invested with new awe and new wonder and new joy. Praise the Lord.